Today I'll be speaking with Dr. Joanne Bakarowski, Professor of Psychology at Vanderbilt University, where she directs the Vocal Acoustics Laboratory. Her work there focuses on laughter and other domains of vocal communication, including the vocal expression of emotion, infant-directed baby talk, as well as speech acoustics more generally. Um, she's previously served as an associate editor for the journal Cognition and Emotion and has received several awards for her work, um, including grants from the NSF as well as the NIMH. Her work, not surprisingly, on laughter has been widely discussed in the media, including the BBC, LA Times, Scientific American, and Discovery. Um, just as a mere example. So with this work on laughter, I'm excited to now turn to our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Joanne Bakarowski from Vanderbilt University on laughter. So welcome, Joanne. Thanks for speaking with us today. And thanks for having me. I'm excited about this. I'm excited, too. Um, so I wanted to start by asking you a little bit about what first got you interested in studying emotion? I actually stumbled on it by accident. I was studying impulsive behavior, mm -hmm. and I was looking for some sort of physiological correlate that would go along with the state of being impulsive. Mm -hmm. And a colleague suggested that I record people's voices. Mm -hmm. And that turned into a vocal expression of emotion, and I really got interested in voice. And what came along with that was understanding emotions as well. So it was a good accident. you got to love serendipitous accidents, exactly, right? Exactly, yes. <laughs> So I wanted to then ask you about your work. So I mean, it's really exciting and you're widely known, especially for your influential work on the acoustics of laughter and you've even developed a comprehensive laughter dictionary. And I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about some of the most exciting discoveries here. I know all of us are really curious about what is laughter and can there really be different kinds of laughter? I think it's one of the most fascinating behaviors that we engage in and I think one of the surprising things to learn is how readily people laugh. And so we can bring people into lab and have them do pretty much anything. And as long as they're in pairs of people or groups of people, then they'll laugh a lot. So that was really surprising to me. Another surprise was just how rich laughter is as a behavioral repertoire. And so, well, as listeners, we can categorize these all as kind of falling in a laugh lump of sounds there are surprising acoustic vari variations in the sounds. And the acoustics themselves are just markedly different than we see in typical speech. And so we have things like the pitch of laughter goes wildly all over the place. We also sometimes produce what are called acoustic nonlinearities, which are very unusual in normal voice or normal speech. And we see them in laughter a good proportion of the time. So that's been really exciting. And then another thing that interests me is the occasions when we don't laugh. Like, what is it about our social partner that would lead us to not laugh or even inhibit our laughter? Wow. So can I ask you a question then about this? So in what ways would you say are, you know, sort of not all laughs alike? Mm -hmm. I think that yeah. one of the most important distinctions is whether laughs are voiced or not. So we kind of lump laughs into these voiced and unvoiced categories. Mm -hmm. And what it means to be a voiced or have a voiced laugh is that the vocal folds are important in the production of that sound. And so when we produce a voiced sound, it has a periodicity to it because the vocal folds are operating in synchrony with each other. When we produce an unvoiced sound, either the vocal folds aren't involved or they're involved more chaotically. And unvoiced sounds are noisier, they're more turbulent, and so things like grunts and snorts are often, I know, <laughs> it's a very rich vocabulary we have, <laughs> but grunts and snorts are often unvoiced. And, well, snorts are necessarily unvoiced because they're coming through the nose. <laughs> and, um, and voice sounds are what we, I think of as prototypical laugh sounds. So we think about these kind of song-like qualities to laughter. Those are voiced laughs. And what we've learned about those laughs is that they are much more likely to elicit positive emotion in the people who hear them. So listeners who hear voice laughs say they're sexier than unvoiced laughs, mm -hmm. that they're more likely to want to meet the person who produced the laugh. They think it's better for a laugh track, and they're saying it makes them feel a lot better than unvoiced sounds or unvoiced laughs. And unvoiced laughs can actually um, elicit negative emotions mm -hmm. in people. So it kind of begs the question of why we produce so many of those. But we do. They're part of our, our repertoire. 
So speaking of that, I mean, you've alluded to some important individual differences in laughter profiles, and I wonder if you could say a little bit about some of the really fascinating gender differences that you found here when examining these different acoustic laughter profiles. I think the gender yeah. differences are just, they're fascinating. So yeah. one thing, we don't get the standard. I think people expect that women laugh more than men, and we've never seen that. So we've now conducted boy, at least a half dozen behavioral studies with a, a substantial number of people in each study. And we've never found that women laugh mm. overall more than men do. But it really depends on who our social partners are that drive mm. laughter. So for example, people laugh more, and this isn't surprising, but we find that people laugh more when they're with somebody than when they're alone. And then they also laugh more with a friend than if they're paired with a stranger. But the most interesting finding with these um, sex differences is that what male subjects do, I think, and that is that when males are with a friend, especially with a male friend, they laugh more and they produce higher pitch laughs, they produce longer laughs, and it's they're doing these kind of over-the-top laughs that I think that we expected ahead of time that women would actually do with their women friends, but it's actually the guys who are doing it with their guy friends, and they'll do it with female friends as well. And they will rarely produce these laughs when they're with a stranger. And that all gets at notions about what kinds of sounds do you want to produce with someone who you know versus who you don't know. So if you think about males, um, they can actually work to kind of reinforce an ongoing relationship if they produce these voiced laughs that make other people feel good. But that might be too much acoustic information if the male hasn't met the, the stranger male or the stranger female. So if you can imagine as a female, if you were to be at a party and a male who you've never met before came up and just laughed really loud and long and <laughs> high pitched, you'd be like, whoa, that's too much information. It's kind of like, you know, too much. Overload. Too much, it is overload. It's yeah. too much, eye, like too much eye gaze or too much physical contact. So males don't produce those kinds of laughs with a stranger but they produce them a lot when they're with a friend, especially with their guy friends. Interesting. I mean, speaking of friendships, I know you've also looked at this really intricate kind of temporal dynamics of laughter and the ways that it can differentiate, you know, close friends from just acquaintances. I wonder mm -hmm. if you could say something about that, too. Yeah, we looked at um, what we call the antiphonal laughter, which essentially just means back and forth laughter. Mm -hmm. And friends are much more likely to produce laughs within like a second or two of their other, the friend that they're being tested with. Whereas strangers are just discordant in their laughter. It's almost like a random event. And um, what's even more interesting is that the friends are more likely to have this antiphonal or synchronous laughter for voiced laughter. So the idea mm -hmm. is that if voice laughter makes other people feel good, the idea with friends is that they can have a learned emotional response to the laugh acoustics of the friend who they know. So they've been with this person repeatedly. They've shared a lot of good times together. They say they're friends. And so when one person produces this voice laugh sound, the other person has this very quick, rapid kind of learned response that includes laughter in, re in response to the initial friend laughing. So interesting. Yeah, Speaking of, you know, social relationships, I mean, you've also uncovered these really, really, I think just like groundbreaking insights into sort of the distinct social consequences of different laughter types that you've spoken about today. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about in what ways do these voiced versus unvoiced laughter elicit different social responses from other people? I think, um, I don't want to correct your question, but yeah, I want to no, amend. Go ahead. We actually haven't studied directly social yeah. consequences, and I think that is a really key question, and it's one that we're like directly underway starting to, yeah. to test in labs, so it's really exciting. And I think that's critically important. What we've done is studied laughter in an almost disembodied way, so people mm. come into lab, they're in a perception study, essentially. They come into a sterile environment and they hear these laughs over headsets, but they're not interacting with the person when they're making judgments about the laughs. Mm -hmm. And we've tested people in these social situations. We haven't yet analyzed data that we have on what, how much did you like your partner if they were producing lots of voice laughter versus how much did you like your partner if they weren't producing those sounds or they weren't laughing a lot. And so we're just really at the beginning stages of being able to address that. But I think it's really the most important kind of question we can be asking about the sounds. Well, I can't wait to hear what your findings, you know, unearth. Thank you. I mean, do you think in any way some of these findings, I know some of it sounds like it's at the forefront of where you're working right now, 
But I wonder if, you know, we're at any point to have a sense of, you know, how we ought to laugh, you know, in society and social interactions. I think the results have implications for that, but the, um, I don't think we have a lot of control over our laughter. So when we try to shape it, it's actually a challenge. And if we want to really mm -hmm. shape it for our lifetime, we really have to kind of work at that. So we might have to work at um, making our laugh less loud or making shorter laughs or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think we do, though, through the course of development, learn a whole lot about what kinds of sounds work in what circumstances. Um, I think that the same way we learn things, like I mentioned earlier about eye gaze and, and physical proximity, we learn what works in, in with, with different kinds of people in different kinds of circumstances. And I think we do the same for our laughter. And then I think that we actually run into pretty, um, I don't want to say dramatic, but I think people really can have social difficulties when they use laughter in the wrong way or in the wrong sorts of circumstances. Um, mm -hmm. And so people talk anecdotally about that, and we haven't directly studied that either at this point. But I do think that in the absence of using laughter effectively, people really can have challenges in their social relationships. So when you think then about sort of where your path has taken you, you know, into the world of emotion kind of serendipitously and now becoming, you know, the laughter expert, you know, and all the discoveries you've made and the directions you're going, where do you see looking ahead sort of the future of emotion headed? What are the important directions? I think, um, well, actually, I was reminded of this all today when mm -hmm. the New York Times announced that Obama's about to spend many, many millions of dollars to understand the brain. And I thought, well, surely there'll be an important role for emotions and, and psychology yeah. in this. And I think that, you know, on the one hand, we are traveling and understanding the brain more, but I think it's also important to kind of hang on to behavior and that really what's most important down the road is to make links between brain behavior relations in a more naturalistic way than we've done with some of our lab paradigms to date. Um, and I think another thing that's really exciting coming down the road with emotions research is being able to use behavioral genetics techniques to understand especially disturbances and dysfunctions in, in laughter. And I mm -hmm. really see the next 10 years as exploding in, in both of those frontiers. Great. So my last question for you then is, what advice do you typically give students who come to you and ask you know, your thoughts on, should I embark in this field? And what are important you know, ways that I should be thinking about becoming an emotion researcher? I think um, what I see with a lot of students is, is they really get revved up about emotions, which is great, mm -hmm. um, and, but they get caught up in technique a little bit too much and, or tools. And so they want to learn imaging or they want to learn eye tracking and they want to learn psychophysiology. And so what I try to shape students to really understand is that those tools and techniques are always going to be there. So behavioral genetics right, is going to be the next of of those tools that we can use. But the most important thing they can do is to identify some core questions that they're passionate about that really tell us something about the heart of what's going on with emotional processing. And if they can get, you know, just develop those important questions and follow through, then, then yes, they can learn imaging and yes, they can learn all these things, but the questions themselves are the most important. Well, thank you so much for speaking today. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Joanne Bakarowski from Vanderbilt University. Thanks again.